Hello everyone, and welcome to this virtual lecture course on quantum condensed matter physics. I'm Dr. Andrew Mitchell, and in this lecture we'll be talking about quantum many-body systems involving fermions, and the second quantization, or occupation number formalism, used to describe them. In the first part of the course, we talked a lot about spin systems, and these were described in terms of quantum mechanical spin operators, whose operator algebra, encoded in the commutation relations, were the same as that of angular momentum. We imagined systems in which the spins were localised in space on lattice sites and studied the spin dynamics. We saw that the elementary excitations of those systems were actually bosonic in nature. But of course, the spins of such systems are due to the spin of the underlying electrons in real condensed matter systems, and electrons are fermions. Electrons can also typically move around in the lattice and we also want to be able to describe metals where the electrons are free to flow. This requires us to generalise our framework, and this uh, is going to be the topic of the second part of the course. We now move on to a disc description of true electronic systems described in terms of fermions. These fermions will not be simply pinned to individual lattice sites. They will occupy uh, atomic orbitals, but the electrons will be able to quantum mechanically tunnel from one orbital to the other. They will feel a static background potential due to the positive nuclei of the lattice, but they'll be free to roam around. However, they'll also be subject to the Coulomb interaction, a repulsion between electrons. This will allow us to describe a much wider range of uh, physical systems. It's a more microscopic description. And indeed, as we'll see in the coming lectures, we can actually derive from more microscopic uh, foundations the Heisenberg exchange model, which we used in the first part of the uh, course to describe uh, magnetic systems and, uh, and spin models. So this is a more microscopic description, <clears throat> but we need a formalism to be able to treat these things. In particular, we will be looking at systems with 10 to the 23 electrons. We need a simple, efficient, elegant way of dealing with these systems. The quantum mechanics is very complicated, and therefore we want a formalism that is the most simple and efficient to use. And this formalism is called second quantization. In this lecture, I'll be introducing this formalism, and we'll be describing it for a single quantum orbital. This is like a qubit state. It either has no electrons in it or one electrons, zero or one. However, Built into the formalism, we will encode the Pauli principle and wave function anti-symmetry and all of this stuff that we need to generalise to quantum systems of many particles. In the coming lectures, we'll further develop this theory and then apply it to real condensed matter systems. So let's get down to work. So in this lecture, we'll be discussing the second quantization formalism for fermions, otherwise known as the occupation number formalism. In this lecture, I want to build up the formalism from scratch, starting from the very basics of quantum mechanics. We'll see that second quantization offers us an immediate advantage in solving quantum many-body problems that appear in condensed matter physics. First of all, let's recall that the indistinguishability of quantum particles implies a parity under particle exchange. This is what we discussed right at the very beginning of the course in lecture one. We saw there how this gives rise to the exchange statistics for quantum particles. And specifically, we have fermions and bosons, which are distinguished by their exchange statistics. Imagine that I write down a quantum mechanical wave function for a many particle system, in which I label the coordinates of each of the n particles, one, two, three, four, and so on. Let's imagine a pair of these particles, i and j. If I exchange these particles, so I swap the labels Ri and Rj, as indicated on the right-hand side here, we know that the wave function turns into itself up to a phase. This phase can either be plus or minus one, simply because if we uh, swap the particle labels and then swap them back again, we know we must get back to our original wave function. So the phase corresponding to particle exchange must square to one, and therefore the phase itself must be either plus or minus one. We call quantum particles that are symmetric under particle exchange bosons, and we call quantum particles that are anti-symmetric with respect to particle exchange fermions. Specifically, let's recall, of course, that electrons are fermions, 
and they're the particles that we're going to be concentrating on in this lecture course. And, as you know, many important properties of a physical system depend on the exchange statistics of their constituent particles. A simple example that we saw many times in the first part of the course is the exchange interaction between a pair of spins. This spin-spin interaction, of course, has its origin in the exchange statistics of the underlying fermions. We'll actually see in more detail in the coming lectures how this really comes about from a microscopic perspective. Now, the physical properties of quantum condensed matter systems and real materials are often controlled by the collective behaviour of electrons in some approximately static background potential due to the underlying crystal lattice structure, the atomic orbitals, the nuclei, and so on. And this is referred to as the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. Of course, this is an approximation, and there are also effects coming from the coupling of electrons to the lattice vibrations, or the phonon modes, but we won't consider that in this course. Here, we'll just focus on the dynamics of the electronic system moving in this approximately static background potential from the lattice. This is often enough to capture the most important or dominant physical effects in a real system. We'll assume that the electrons can occupy various atomic orbitals, but that the electrons are not confined to these individual orbitals, but can quantum mechanically tunnel from one orbital to the other. The overlap between the individual quantum mechanical wave functions for isolated atomic orbitals is of course what gives rise to chemical bonding and what holds the whole structure together in the first place. So now we will focus on the electrons, which are free to move around. They have a kinetic energy and can quantum mechanically tunnel through potential barriers from one atomic orbital to another atomic orbital. We'll assume that the electrons are subject to some background potential which in reality, of course, is due to the crystal lattice and the positive nuclei that make it up. Additionally, the electrons will, of course, interact with each other through the Coulomb repulsion, and this is another form of the potential energy. Considering both kinetic and potential energy terms, we can then construct Hamiltonians which describe the underlying quantum mechanics of these electronic systems. But how do we formulate models of quantum systems involving many electrons? In particular, how do we encode the fermionic wave function antisymmetry in our many particle wave functions? And when we have these, how do we solve the Schrodinger equation to find our eigenstates and eigenenergies? And how do we use that information to find out physical properties of interest of our system? Of course, these are precisely the key questions in quantum condensed matter physics of fermionic systems. These are the questions we'll be asking and answering in the remaining lectures of this course. So how do we encode the fermion antisymmetry in our many particle wave functions? First of all, let's consider a single particle quantum state, phi. We label the specific state with the index nu. The label nu distinguishes different single particle quantum states. It could, for example, be uh, one of the quantum numbers, such as the momentum, k, or the spin, sigma and the position of the particle in this orbital will be denoted by r. How do we now construct the basis for a two-particle system? Well, one might imagine that we proceed very similarly to how we did in the first part of the lecture course uh, with our spins. We might imagine that a good many-particle basis uh, can be built from product states of our single-particle states. I could then write that a wave function for a two-particle system, psi, labelled by the particle positions R1 and R2, can be constructed as the product of these single particle orbitals, phi nu1 for particle uh, at position R1, and phi nu2 for the second orbital, with a particle located at position R2. However, it's obvious that this two particle wave function does not have the correct antisymmetry property for exchange of particles 1 and 2. If we're going to build the wave functions of a given Hamiltonian, which obey the proper antisymmetry condition, then we need to start with basis states, which also have the correct antisymmetry condition. And basis states with this product state form do not have this correct antisymmetry property. Of course, in this trivial two-particle setup, it's very easy to simply write down a wave function that does have the right property. We can simply write psi of r1 and r2 as 1 over root 2 phi nu1 of coordinate r1 times phi nu2 of coordinate r2 
and then minus phi nu1 of coordinate r2 times phi nu2 of coordinate r1. Clearly, if I exchange the 1 and 2 labels of our particle here, this wave function will turn into minus itself. This kind of basis state clearly satisfies the correct anti-symmetry conditions. However, the problem of properly symmetrizing our basis states becomes very, very complicated the more and more particles we add. One solution to this problem is to use so-called Slater determinants. It's to write our fermionic wave functions of our many-particle system in terms of determinants of the single-particle states. In the two-particle case, we can see that our anti-symmetrized uh, basis state here can actually be written as the determinant with some normalization condition at the front here, in this case, 1 over root 2. And then we simply have all possible permutations of the orbitals and particle positions. So on the top row, we have particle 1. On the bottom row, particle 2. On the first column, we have the orbital phi nu 1. And in the second column, the orbital phi nu 2. When we expand out this determinant, we take this diagonal minus this diagonal. And of course, that's precisely our expression for psi r1, r2. This can be generalized to n particle systems, such that the basis states are properly anti-symmetric under exchanging the labels of any two particles. The result is the generalized Slater determinants, which take this form. I consider a basis state psi labeled by the particle positions for an n particle system, r1, r2, r3, and so on, all the way up to rn. Up to some normalization factor, which in this case is 1 over the square root of n factorial, we have a determinant. Again, it comprises all possible combinations. The way to read this determinant is that on the top row, we have particle 1, the second row, we have particle 2, and so on, all the way down to the nth row for particle n. Then, in the columns, we have the different quantum orbitals, nu1, nu2, nu3, and so on, all the way up to nu n. A properly anti-symmetrized fermionic basis state can then be obtained by computing the determinant of this whole object. This automatically satisfies the proper anti-symmetry condition, because if we exchange two particles, that's basically equivalent to swapping a pair of rows in this determinant. And we know that from the fundamental properties of determinants, that if we swap any two rows, then we get a minus sign. This is exactly the minus sign that we require for the anti-symmetry of our wave function on exchange of particle labels. Furthermore, this property holds for exchanging any pair of particles. So the properties of these determinants are exactly what we need for the anti-symmetry condition of our fermionic wave functions. Now, I want to emphasize at this point that these Slater determinants are not necessarily eigenstates of a given Hamiltonian. They're just suitable basis states in terms of which we can construct properly anti-symmetrized many-particle wave functions. The Slater determinants are just a good way of constructing the underlying basis. This is analogous to our discussion of spin systems, where we chose our convenient basis to be the product state basis of individual sites. Now, you might be wondering why we didn't have to do all of this when we were talking about spins, given that those spins originate from the electrons, which are themselves fermions. But that's actually a little bit subtle. As we saw in the first part of the course, the quantum operators representing spin are actually bosonic in nature. This is something we'll come back to again in the coming lectures. So because of that fact, when dealing with pure spin systems, we didn't need to construct a basis that needed to be anti-symmetrized in this way. For true fermionic systems that we're discussing in this lecture, we need to construct a basis that is not simply a product state basis, but that is properly anti-symmetrized under the exchanging of labels. Hence, we have to deal with these complicated Slater determinants. So our basis will comprise the set of these Slater determinants. But of course, we still need to solve the underlying Schrodinger equation for a given Hamiltonian using this basis. This whole formalism is what's known as first quantization. This is in counterpoint to second quantization, which will be the main topic of this lecture. But first, let me try to explain why there's a need for an alternative formulation for quantum many-body systems involving fermions.
probably the most significant and severe problem with first quantization is that performing actual calculations can be very cumbersome and computationally expensive. It just takes a huge amount of effort to compute anything when the system size is large. For example, if we consider calculating some matrix element of an arbitrary operator, this actually requires us to form n factorial squared different products of the objects appearing in these slater determinants. When n is large, this basically just becomes computationally intractable. We wish to find a representation where the calculation of these kind of objects is straightforward and cheap computationally. Secondly, the representation in first quantization requires a fixed particle number n. We see that these slater determinants from which our basis is made is an n by n determinant. We have n particles and n quantum orbitals. This is something that's fixed in the calculation. However, we know from statistical mechanics that when we're talking about a system with a large number of particles, n is something like 10 to the 23 or so, it is often more convenient to work in the grand canonical ensemble where n is allowed to fluctuate. This simply can't be accommodated within the first quantization formalism. Finally, quantum numbers are not so easily encoded within the first quantized formalism. We would like a formulation of our many-particle quantum mechanics in which the quantum numbers of quasi-particles are fundamental, not, as we see with these later determinants, as an entangled set of quantum numbers of all of the constituents. Within first quantization, it's difficult to answer questions like, what is the probability that if I put a particle into a system at coordinate x1 and time t1, that we can take it out at some other point, x2 and at time t2? These are basically questions about the quantum dynamics of the system. They basically determine the quantum transport, for example, the electrical current flow due to a bias voltage. These are the kind of questions we wish to answer in quantum condensed matter physics, but they're rather hard to deal with in first quantization. That's why we seek an alternative formulation which describes the same kind of physics, but one that allows us to treat this physics in an efficient and simple way. This is where second quantization comes in. Second quantization is often also called, more descriptively, the occupation number formalism, and we'll see why that's the case. In fact, second quantization as a name is a little bit of a misnomer. The terminology is uh, somewhat misleading. There is only one quantization of classroom mechanics to get quantum mechanics. Nothing else is quantized a second time. The name here is just a historical quirk but it's standard terminology, so we'll stick with it. Second quantization is the standard way in which many particle quantum mechanics is formulated. It is elegant and it is efficient. It is a formulation based on the algebra of ladder operators, like we saw for the quantum harmonic oscillator in the first lecture, and as we've been using in the last few weeks to describe spin systems. We've already implicitly been using some kind of second quantization when we were talking about those spin systems, but now we're going to put it on a more fundamental footing. Second quantization provides a compact way of representing the many-body space of excitations. As the number of particles or orbitals in the system grows, this becomes especially important because the underlying Hilbert space is growing exponentially. Properties such as the fermionic wave function antisymmetry and the Pauli principle are realized automatically and effortlessly within this framework. Furthermore, the properties of quantum mechanical operators are encoded in a simple set of commutation or anti-commutation relations, rather than in some explicit Hilbert space representation. Finally, and most importantly, this second quantization formalism greatly simplifies actual calculations, as we'll see in this lecture. First of all, let's consider a single fermionic quantum mechanical degree of freedom. Understanding this system, will be the foundation on which everything else rests, so it's a good place to start. Later on in the lecture, we'll expand this to multiple degrees of freedom. For a single fermionic degree of freedom, the state is either occupied or unoccupied. These are the only two possibilities for fermions due to the Pauli principle. Of course, compare this with the bosonic case, where we can put arbitrarily many bosons into a single quantum state. For fermions, the Pauli principle tells us that a given quantum state can be either occupied or unoccupied, and that's it. 
the occupied or unoccupied states of this quantum orbital basically define a two-level system, or a qubit. The complete local state space of this orbital can be denoted by these uh, Dirac brackets. There's a zero ket, or a one ket. The zero is for the empty state, the one is for the occupied state. These are often referred to as qubit states uh, in analog to the regular classical uh, bit, which is a zero or a one. Here we have a zero ket and a one ket in our quantum mechanical state, so we refer to that as a quantum bit or a qubit. Of course, in the quantum mechanical world, we can have arbitrary complex superpositions of our basis states, and of course this makes the problem much more rich than in the classical world, where we have a discrete degree of freedom, zero or one only. These are really quantum mechanical kets, zero and one. At the moment, we can regard this zero and one simply as a label to distinguish these two possibilities. But as we'll see, as hinted by this notational choice, we're actually really labeling here these states by their occupation. We'll see on the coming slides why it is that we're allowed to label our states by their occupation numbers and why this is a good idea. So for a single qubit, we label the states by their occupation number. We specify the ket for the state by this number n, which is either 0 or 1 only. This n is a quantum number that corresponds to the fermionic occupation of this state. Because n stands for the occupation, n cannot be negative. The smallest number of particles that the state can have is obviously 0. On the other hand, the Pauli principle tells us that we cannot put two quantum particles in the same orbital with the same quantum numbers and therefore the maximum value n can take is 1. Therefore, the dimensionality of the local Hilbert space for this quantum orbital is 2. And this complex vector space is spanned by the complete set of states 0 or 1. Notice here that I'm denoting the Hilbert space by this curly uh, h, this calligraphic h here. This is not meant to be the Hamiltonian, it's meant to denote the underlying Hilbert space. OK, so let's discuss some of the properties of this space and some of the operators that we can define that act on this space. The basis states labelled by this occupation number, 0 and 1, for a single qubit, are orthonormal. This means that if I form the overlap, or more precisely the inner product, of a state with itself, I get 1. The state is normalised. However, the state 0 is orthogonal to the state 1. So the overlap or the inner product of 0 with 1 or 1 with 0 is likewise equal to 0. Here I'm using the corresponding bras for the 0 and 1 states. They are simply defined in terms of the corresponding kets, simply as the adjoint or the dagger, otherwise known as the complex transpose. This is how we turn our ket into our bra. In first quantization, this closed bracket here means that we multiply the function corresponding to the orbital by its complex conjugate and then integrate over all space. However, all of that, of course, is absorbed into this notation uh, when we're talking about second quantization, and we don't have to worry about that. Provided these states are orthonormal, we won't have to ever do any of these kind of integrals. As we will see in the coming lectures, the discussion of many-particle quantum mechanics actually avoids completely any of these kind of integrals. We work directly with the Dirac brackets. The meaning of these brackets in terms of some real space function describing the probability density of a given atomic orbital is uh, absorbed and hidden in this notation, and we'll actually see we simply don't need that. With this basis at hand, we can now define ladder operators. In the context of uh, second quantization for fermions, these are referred to as creation or annihilation operators. The creation operators are defined in this way. And here I've put a hat on the top to remind us that it's an operator. When C dagger acts on the empty state, it gives us the occupied state. Therefore, it's like creating an electron in this state, and that's why we call it a creation operator. Likewise, uh, the operator C here is the corresponding annihilation operator. 
Again, I've put a hat on the top to denote the fact that it's an operator. When C acts on the occupied state, one ket, it gives us the empty state, zero ket. In that sense, it's annihilating the electron that's in this orbital. However, notice that we cannot annihilate an electron if it's not there. Therefore, the C hat operator acting on the empty state gives zero. Not the zero ket, but literally just equals zero on the other side. This means that it is not possible to annihilate an electron in a state that has no electrons. Likewise, it is not possible to add an electron to a state that's already occupied. This, of course, embodies the Pauli principle. Therefore, the underlying Hilbert space H is spanned by these operators C and C dagger. And since we have a closed two-dimensional Hilbert space as defined by these equations, we can actually find an expression for the operators C hat and C hat dagger in terms of these underlying basis states 0 and 1. I can write that C dagger hat is equal to ket 1 and bra 0. Likewise, C hat is equal to ket 0 bra 1. What do these mean and how do I understand these equations? Well, these definitions actually follow directly from our orthonormality condition and the fact that we're living in a restricted two-dimensional Hilbert space. For example, if I act with C dagger on the empty state, zero ket, and I use this definition of the C dagger operator, then I obtain this thing. Here I see, of course, the inner product or the overlap of the zero state with itself, which is, of course, equal to one. And this just gives us leftover with the one ket. And this is, of course, what we want from the definition of these uh, creation uh, operators. On the other hand, if I act with C dagger on the one state, then um, I end up with an object involving the inner product of zero and one. And from the uh, orthonormality condition, this is equal to zero. So this uh, actually embodies the Pauli principle as written here. And of course, you can write something similar for the action of the annihilation operator. This also tells us about Hermitian conjugation. Let's consider the Hermitian conjugate of the C dagger operator. So this is equivalent to writing C dagger all daggered here. The dagger here, as usual, represents the adjoint or the complex transpose. Of course, from this definition of our C dagger operator, uh, this thing on the left-hand side must be equal to this thing on the right-hand side. And of course, we know how to dagger the individual brass and kets. When we're daggering a uh, product of these things, we have to swap the order and dagger each of them individually. Uh, this, of course, following from the usual properties of um, taking the complex transpose. In this particular case, we'll therefore end up with the zero and the one states swapped over like this. But of course, this is precisely the definition of the annihilation operator C hat, as we see from here. So what this tells us is that um, taking the dagger of C dagger gives us C. Likewise, if we take the dagger of the C operator, then by the same logic, we see that this is equal to the C dagger operator. So this might seem obvious, um, actually, it's important that we go through this once and for all, just to make sure that it's correct. And then you can understand that this is actually a rather nice and natural uh, notation to use. If we take the dagger of the C operator, we get C dagger. If we get C dagger and we dagger it again, we get back to C. Note something very important here. The operators C and C dagger are not Hermitian operators. Recall that a Hermitian operator is one where when you take the dagger, you get the operator back again. The Hamiltonian is an example of a Hermitian operator. These operators C and C dagger are not themselves Hermitian. However, we do refer to them as Hermitian conjugates. This means that if I take the dagger of one operator, I get the other. And if I take the dagger of the other operator, I get back to the first one. Since the Hamiltonian is Hermitian, but these objects are only Hermitian conjugates, it means that we cannot construct a Hamiltonian out of individual C and C dagger operators. Actually, this makes eminent good sense. You might have been worried on the previous slide 
that we introduced creation and annihilation operators for electrons. But we know, of course, that charge is conserved. Spin is conserved. So how do we just create or destroy electrons? Surely this makes uh, no physical sense. The resolution of this quandary is, as we'll see, that when we construct a Hamiltonian describing a physical system, we will not find individual C and C dagger operators on their own. Rather, we'll see only pairs of these things. When we construct a Hamiltonian that's quadratic in these operators, we'll see that we can build Hamiltonians which conserve charge. We'll be unpacking the meaning of that uh, in this and the coming lectures. So for now, you can simply regard the annihilation operator C and the creation operator C dagger as being mathematical objects, which are defined on the underlying state space. At the moment, they might seem rather abstract, but we'll soon see how we can give them physical meaning. Next, let's define the identity operator. The identity operator is defined as the sum of projectors onto all the possible states of the system. In this case, we're using the basis of 0 and 1 states. This equation is also known as the resolution of the identity. It's a fundamental expression that we'll be utilising many times. It's defined such that when we act with the identity operator 1 hat on a given state, for example the 0 state here, we get back the 0 state. It's as if we're just multiplying by the number 1. In detail, that happens when we expand out the, exp the expression for the identity operator in this way. Here we have the inner product of 0 with itself, which is 1. In the second term, we have the inner product of 1 with 0, which from the orthonormality condition is 0. And this is how we obtain back our result that 1 hat acting on 0 gives us the state 0 back again. Likewise, if I act with the identity operator 1 hat on the state 1, then I find that I get back the state 1. Again, this is because of the orthonormality condition. This first inner product here is now the one that's 0, and the second one is 1. In fact, it's straightforward to show that the identity operator 1 hat acting on any state psi, which can be any complex linear combination of the states 0 and 1, will always give me back the state psi. And in this sense, we refer to this object as the identity, or the identity operator. And writing it out in full here in terms of projectors is referred to as resolution of the identity. In this case, the identity operator takes a simple form because we only have a two-dimensional state space. We'll see later on when we include more orbitals that this expression will become more complicated to account for all the possibilities in our underlying space. Next, we'll define a very important operator called the number operator. This is denoted n hat, and it's an operator. It is defined for a single quantum orbital as being c dagger c. So it is a combination of the creation operator, c dagger, and the annihilation operator, c. Note that the operator n hat, as defined, is actually a Hermitian operator. What I mean by that, of course, is that if I take the dagger of this operator, I get the operator back again. Why is that? How can I show that? Well, simply, I can use here the expression in terms of our creation and annihilation operators, and then use the properties that we've just worked out. So if I were to take the dagger of C dagger C, I know this gives me C dagger times C dagger dagger. Recall that when I take the dagger of a pair of operators, I have to dagger each of them separately, but also swap the order as I've denoted here. And as we've just been at lengths to demonstrate, this can then simply be written as C dagger C, which indeed is the definition of the number operator. So this is a self-adjoint operator, it's Hermitian. This also implies, of course, that we can uh, include such an operator when we construct a Hamiltonian operator. The Hamiltonian should be Hermitian, and therefore it needs to be built out of Hermitian operators, such as n hat. We'll see explicit examples of this shortly. OK, but why did I call this a number operator? How does n hat act on our basis states? Well, let's just try it out. Let's say that we act with n hat on our zero state. 
I can write this in terms of C dagger C acting on our zero state. And we know that we cannot destroy um, an electron if the state is already empty. So this is going to give me zero. Of course, I can write this as zero times the state uh, zero ket back again. This might seem a little bit weird, but it'll emphasize that actually um, the states zero and one are actually eigenstates of this n hat operator. To see that, let's act with n hat on our one state. That means c dagger c acting on our one state. Here, we can take this uh, piece by piece. First of all, C dagger acting on the state 1, we know by definition gives us 0, and therefore this is C dagger acting on 0, and of course we know that that gives us back the 1 state. So indeed we see that the states 0 and 1 are actually eigenstates of this number operator with an eigenvalue n, which describes the occupation. So this might seem like a bit of a gratuitous equation here, but it's actually very important. It tells us that when we labeled our states 0 and 1, this was actually a quantum number. The n here is actually the number of electrons in the system. It's a quantum number. It's an eigenvalue of the operator n hat. So the states 0 and 1 weren't just labelled by an arbitrary index, they were actually labelled by an eigenvalue of a specific quantum mechanical operator, and it's this one, n hat. So the states 0 and 1 are eigenstates of the number operator n hat. The eigenvalue n is the occupation number, and this can really be regarded as a quantum number. What kind of Hamiltonian operator can we write down for our single quantum mechanical degree of freedom, our single quantum state? Well, actually, there's not much we can write down. The Hamiltonian has to be Hermitian, of course. Uh, this is because it should have real eigenvalues, the eigenvalues being the energies, they should be real quantities. And therefore, the only allowed terms in our Hamiltonian must themselves be Hermitian. Of course, these Hermitian operators might be built from non-Hermitian operators, as we saw in the case of the number operator, n hat is c dagger c. c dagger and c separately are not Hermitian, but n hat is Hermitian. So what kind of thing can we write down for a Hamiltonian? Well, for a single orbital, there is really not much we can write down. We can write down something like n hat times some coupling constant, let's call that epsilon. What kind of other terms can we add? Well, there's not really much else we can add, because notice that if I take n hat squared, this actually gives me back the operator n hat. It's a so-called idempotent operator. I will leave that for you to confirm yourselves. So because of that fact, there's no real point in me adding higher powers of n hat, because this will all just be the same as adding a single n hat. Uh, on the other hand, um, we cannot have uh, an odd number of these uh, C or C dagger operators in our Hamiltonian, because then the Hamiltonian will not be Hermitian. So this is basically the most general thing that we can write down. It's also easy to show that the commutator of the Hamiltonian operator with n hat is equal to zero. Why? Because if we just write it out, we get epsilon n hat n hat minus n hat epsilon n hat, but epsilon here is just a number, so we can obviously commute this epsilon out the front here, and then obviously that thing gives me zero. What's the importance of this commutator vanishing? Well, it tells us that we can form a simultaneous eigenbasis of the Hamiltonian and our number operator. What that means is that we can label the eigenstates of our Hamiltonian by the eigenvalues of our number operator. This is extremely important because it tells us that our occupation number basis, 0 and 1, are actually eigenstates of this Hamiltonian. And of course, that's easy to verify. If I act with h hat on our 0 state, then I get the 0 state back again, times an eigenvalue of 0. On the other hand, if h hat acts on the 1 state, 
I get the one state back again, times the eigenvalue epsilon. So we see that the eigenvalues of the Schrodinger equation, which are of course the energies, are zero and epsilon. What does this mean? It basically tells us that epsilon, appearing in the Hamiltonian here, is a potential energy. If there are no electrons in the orbital, then there are no electrons to feel the potential, and we get an energy of zero. On the other hand, if one electron occupies the orbital, then it has an energy of epsilon. Epsilon is referred to as the single particle energy. It's really the energy of an electron in that quantum orbital. Finally, we come to the anti-commutation relations for the fermions within the second quantized formalism. These anti-commutation relations really encode the operator algebra. As we'll see, in the end, we only need to know these anti-commutation relations in order to do actual calculations for many particle systems in the second quantized formalism. So how do we derive these anti-commutation relations and what information does it encode? First of all, consider C dagger C acting on the identity operator one hat. The first step is to write out the definition of our identity operator in terms of bras and kets. This is the projector onto the empty state plus the projector onto the occupied state. And we can consider the action of C dagger C on each of these in turn. First of all, let's consider C dagger C acting on the projector onto the empty state. In a moment, we'll consider C dagger C acting on the projector onto the occupied state. First of all, here we see immediately that the destruction or annihilation operator acting on the empty state is going to give us zero. We can't further annihilate an electron when there are no electrons there. On the other hand, in the second term, um, this will give us um, our empty state. We annihilate an electron in an occupied orbital. And then in the second step, you can see that we will act with C dagger on zero to give us back the one state. Overall, this whole thing gives us the projector onto the one state. Let's consider now C, C dagger acting on the identity operator. Here you see that I've switched the order of the operators. In the first example, it was C dagger C. In the second example, it's C, C dagger. I proceed in exactly the same way. C, C dagger acting on the zero projector plus C, C dagger acting on the one projector. In the first term, this will give me the one state. In the second term, the Pauli principle tells us that I cannot create another electron if the orbital is already occupied. So let's go back to this first uh, term here. We will then have C acting on the one state. The annihilation operator acting on the occupied state will give us back zero. And so overall, we get a projector onto the zero state. So let's simply add up these two results. On the left hand side I write C dagger C acting on the identity operator plus C C dagger acting on the identity operator and I'm just factorizing out the, the identity operator here. And then on the right hand side I have the projector onto zero plus the projector onto one. Of course you'll notice that on the right hand side this is the definition of the identity operator. This tells us that the anti-commutator of the operators C dagger and C is equal to 1, or more correctly, I should say, the identity operator. Recall here the definition of the anti-commutator, which is denoted with these curly brackets and a comma separating two operators A and B, is defined simply as being AB plus BA. As we saw, that's the definition inside here in the black brackets. Also notice that because this is symmetric, um, it doesn't matter whether I look at the anti-commutator of C dagger and C, or C and C dagger. By the same definition, I can write down that the anti-commutator of C with C is just twice C times C, 
And likewise, the anti-commutator of C dagger with C dagger is twice C dagger times C dagger. But what do these objects give us? Well, actually, these operators actually give us zero when they act on any of the states of the system. Let's work through them all in turn and convince ourselves of that fact. First of all, let's look at C times C acting on the empty state. This obviously gives me zero on the right-hand side, because when I try to annihilate an electron in the empty state, I immediately get zero. In the second expression, I act with C times C on the uh, occupied state. This also gives me zero. When we act with the annihilation operator on the uh, occupied state, we of course get the unoccupied state, but then I can't further reduce the occupation number by acting again with another annihilation operator, and so the right-hand side is again equal to zero. Likewise, if I act with C dagger C dagger on the uh, empty state, I get zero, and when I act with C dagger C dagger on the occupied state, I get zero. This then tells us the other anti-commutators, that the anti-commutator of C with itself is equal to zero, and the anti-commutator of C dagger with itself is equal to zero. So these are all the possible permutations. Um, this closes our operator algebra. We have an anti-commutator for C dagger with C, which gives me one, but that C with C, or C dagger with C dagger, both give me zero. The physics that's encoded here in these anti-commutators is the two-dimensionality of the local Hilbert space and the Pauli principle. As we'll see in the next lecture, when we generalize this to multiparticle systems, the corresponding anti-commutators will also encode the fermionic anti-symmetry of the wave function under particle exchange. In this way, all of the fundamental quantum mechanical properties of our system can be encoded in these simple operator relations. In carefully setting up the formalism in this way, we then don't have to worry about these things ever again. They're automatically built into the operators themselves. In the next lecture, we'll look at how to extend this to two-particle systems, and hence to n-particle systems. Ultimately, in condensed metaphysics, we're interested in systems with many quantum particles, in the thermodynamic limit, 10 to the 23 quantum particles. Therefore, we need an efficient, elegant, and generalizable formalism. And that is precisely the second quantization formalism, which I introduced in this lecture.